The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community and online store built for engineers and hobbyists alike. Join now and browse the store at element14.com. Benjamin J. Heckendorf. Every week he takes on new projects, shares tips and tricks, and answers your viewer questions on The Ben Heck Show. Hello and welcome back to The Ben Heck Show. Over the years, you've seen us bring many designs to life as we've created custom cases for projects. My background in graphic design plays a large role in the things I build and helps me to combine functionality with design aesthetics. Today we're going into detail on my design process to give you ideas on how to execute your next project. But first, the news. Today in Bad News, I'd like to show you the new ghost that we made for America's Most Haunted. He's hollow now, which allows RGB lights to shine up inside of him and illuminate him based off what mode you're in. His arms are also printed at an upward angle, which allows us to print him without overhangs. So let me show you some of the colors he can do. When you just fight in a regular ghost minion, he turns white, and it flashes brighter and dims when you hit him. You can also change different colors based off modes. Now all the modes in the game have a color associated with them. For instance, the Doctor Ghost mode is green. So when you get to the Doctor Ghost, the ghost turns green. The bar ghost is blue, theater ghost is yellow. Okay, now you see he's turned green. So we're like, oh, the light's green, the ghost is green, we're in this mode. Also, the targets for that mode are green too. So then when you attack him, he'll flash and fade back to green, which is a really cool effect. So there you have it, our RGB backlit super ghost for America's Most Haunted. The first major tip I'd like to give you is test your project and make sure it works before you start designing any cool enclosures for it. Always make sure your project works first. If you install it inside of something, it's much harder to troubleshoot later on. You might also realize you're missing a vital component and suddenly there's no room to fit it in. When working with PCBs, it's handy to be able to get at them from both sides. Something else that's tricky once it's been installed. My next major tip, design on paper first, computer second. Paper is fast, computers are slow. Lay out your parts on a large sheet of paper. This helps you visualize in full scale where things will go and how they fit together. Design your project around the largest component. If you're making a custom portable device, this will likely be the LCD. Trace around your components to determine the inner size of your enclosure. Even if you've measured your components very precisely, it's a good practice to still leave a sixteenth of an inch spacing around things, just in case. Then drop an outer shell at least one eighth of an inch thick around that. Inside this outer shell, draw placement for the screws. You'll need the diameter of the screw plus enough material around that for it to grip the case material without breaking. A good rule of thumb is the width of the screw's head plus a little bit more. If the screw is countersunk, you'll need an even larger diameter. All of this adds up, so it's important to accommodate it early on. My next major tip, start with a two-dimensional design with an emphasis on symmetry. Doesn't matter if you're a good artist, anyone can draw a line. Just hash it out on paper before the computer. Trace over your first drawing to start creating locations for buttons and other components. Go for symmetry whenever possible. For instance, if your device has a screen, make sure the spacing around the edges of it are equal on at least two sides. If it truly can't be centered, use decorations and other feature to make it appear centered, like we did with the Raspberry Pi Portable. Things like controls shouldn't be centered vertically because that would be unnatural to hold, but we can center them horizontally between the edges of the screen and the edges of the case. This creates a symmetry pleasing to the eye and is one of those things that only looks wrong when you forget to do it. Components themselves should also be symmetrical. On our prototype board, the center of the D-pad is the same distance from the upper left corner as the center of the four face buttons is from the upper right corner. Along with making it look nice, this gives us a great reference point to measure from when we design both our case and the PCB. The perf board has 0.1 inch spaced holes which also make for easy alignment and measuring. Once we mock up the position of the battery pack, we can safely estimate and draw what our case will actually look like. Again, it's important to leave yourself extra space inside for mods, wires, and other issues that might crop up. Now it's finally time to get those designs in the computer. There are many free and or cheap solutions for project design. 
Blender is an open source 3D rendering program that can be used for animation as well as design. OpenSCAD allows you to mathematically create 3D objects using a programming language. Inkscape is a free vector drawing program like Adobe Illustrator. You may choose to design something in 2D using Inkscape, then use OpenSCAD to extrude your design into 3D. Finally, there's Autodesk 123D, which is like a free, really stripped down version of Inventor. We'll be using Autodesk 123D as our example. First, we take our full size sketch and measure its dimensions. For sanity's sake, I usually round up to the nearest whole number. Most 3D programs start in a 2D mode called Sketch View. I'm using Sketch View to draw the rectangle we measured to the correct size, then I give it rounded corners. Since I added extra space back on my drawings, I know these rounded corners won't eat into the space I need for the PCB. I then draw in the screw mounts and location of components. It's best to draw as many things in 2D sketch mode as possible before you start extruding in 3D. Once you have it all and it looks right, start extruding the faces out to the height you need to fit your components. Remember, a component is only as small as its largest part. Sometimes you can relocate larger parts, like capacitors, to an area of your project or PCB where you have more room. Remember to also measure the height of components on the bottom of your PCB and recess areas of your case for those to fit as well. They can add up and really sneak up on you. Wiring will also take up a lot of room, so try to keep its use to a minimum, use ribbon cables to consolidate signals into one connection, and reuse ground signals when possible to further reduce wiring. Now that you've got your designs on the computer, it's important to design what you can build. Just because you can draw it on a screen doesn't mean you can make it in real life. Our shop has all the same kinds of equipment you'd find at most hackerspaces, including 3D printers, which are all the rage. While awesome, they do have limitations. You always need to pick a bottom of your project where the print will start from. This area will have less accuracy than the rest of the print. This is less of a problem with stereolithography resin printers, but those are expensive and less common. Much like a bridge, overhangs can't really work without support, since the machine can't print in the thin air, or at least do it very well. You should design curved portions leading up to overhangs so the material can support itself while being built. 3D slicing software can automatically include support structure, very much like scaffolding on a building, but this can be a pain to remove and also increases print time. When possible, prevent overhangs ahead of time in your design. This original 3D printed ghost had outstretched arms, which required supports and increased the print time of the build as well as the cleanup time. Areas like the mouth here ended up getting messy support material even though it didn't need it. The new version of the ghost has arms at a gradual upwards angle allowing the material to support itself as it prints. Thus, no supports required. It prints better and faster. Laser cutters and engravers are great at what they do, but are also limited in some ways. They are best at woods and plastics, and many types of plastic don't work at all, such as polycarbonate. You can only cut flat pieces, so to make structures, you need to link pieces together or use expensive spacers and other fasteners. Finally, when slotting pieces together, material thickness is very important. Unfortunately, most materials are not the actual thicknesses labeled, usually because they're actually metric and have been rounded up to imperial. For instance, this plywood is labeled as quarter inch, but is actually six millimeter, a decent amount thinner than actual quarter inch. Lame! CNC mills such as this shop bot or a shapoku are great for cutting large objects out of a variety of material stocks. However, you can only mill the materials from one direction, the top, and again, only from one side at a time unless your machine is a more advanced four or five axis mill. Again, more rare and expensive. I sure don't have one. CNC mills can do 3D objects as shown here by rastering the bit back and forth through the material, leaving behind a 3D object. It's like 3D printing, but a subtractive process rather than an additive one. It's faster than 3D printing, but also much slower than normal 2D mill work. Just as important as how you'll build your project is how it can be taken apart. The screws should be clear and obvious, and if they're countersunk deep, be sure the opening is wide enough for a standard screwdriver. Not everyone will have as wide an assortment of screwdrivers as you do. As you can see with this Pi Portable, the wires between the halves all fold at the same point. This reduces the amount of extra space they consume inside the case. It's also a good practice that your project can be completely opened and laid flat, like a book. It makes it easier to build and later on, easier to mod or fix. Accessing files on your ancient floppies? Less than easy. 
Getting exclusive access to content, contests, and myself on the Ben Heck Show page found in the Element 14 community? So much easier. Discover all of the ways we're building an easier experience at element14.com forward slash evolution. And finally, I'm going to share with you some aesthetic design tips, basic concepts to help your project look good. So these are what I consider to be the three most important things in design. The first one is shape. How does the shape of your design hold up? Not only does it have to hold the content inside of it, but just the shape of it, someone should look at it and say, oh, I know what that is. If you see the shadow of a game controller, you know what it is. If you see the silhouette of an iPhone, you know what it is. Even something like a fan, you know, from a distance, if it's just a silhouette, you know what it is. That's a really good way to make design so it stands out and people are like, oh, I know what that is. I can identify what that product is. I get it. Like a big McDonald's M on the horizon at night. Contrast is also really important. This is kind of like a cow looking controller here, but it shows that brightness and darkness are what really sets off detail and design on your product. Not necessarily color, because all color looks like some sort of popsicle that you use on the 4th of July which is fine, it just doesn't really look like a good product. So when you do use color, it's good to use other colors around it like uh, black or light. Black is a great thing to set off any color because black is really dark. So any color on top of black pops out even more. Third, uh, fuzz. You know, when you look at something from a distance, does it still make sense? Uh, this goes a lot for text. So if you have like a logo for your product or your thing that you're building, or you've got instruction text on it, you squint your eyes and stand back. Does it still make sense? Uh, if not, you should probably work on your design more. This one, the top one fades out pretty quickly. It's kind of hard to see. We have a larger one that has um, shadowing and outlines, and that one stands out a lot better. So think about it, you know, stand back away from the thing and squint your eyes. Can you still read it? Can you still tell what the shape is? So those are my three tenets of design. Well, hopefully these tips and tricks will come in handy for your next project. Remember, how well it looks is just as important as how well it works. Today's viewer question comes from Christian who asks, is it possible to create a long range communicator without using the internet? Yes, I'd suggest using an XB wireless module, which can send serial data back and forth between two units. We've used them before on the show, most recently on the remote mail detection device. There are even models with a 10 mile range. That's all the time we have for today. In our next episode, we'll build a custom console case from scratch, completely by hand. That's right, I'm unplugging the CNC, laser, and 3D printer to show you how you can still create cool enclosures even if you don't have access to fancy machinery. We'll see you then. Stay tuned at element14.com forward slash TBHS where you can join the discussion, suggest builds for the show, and even have a chance to win upcoming builds. Remember, you can always email build ideas to benheck at element14.com. Thanks for watching.